And my middle son convinced my husband to take him hunting um, the, the next day over to some property where we have um, just a two blind seater over there. And so, um, you know, my, uh, my youngest son still wanted to go hunting. And so here we are at this, you know, venture where it's like, okay, well, I can take you. I can totally take you. I'm, I can go hunting. Yes, I can. And so we just kind of did that. You know, my son, uh, my youngest son, I wasn't his last choice. I was not. I know I was not. But anyway, he's decided, okay, well, mom, okay, me and you will go hunting together. And so we went up into our deer stand, which, um, real quick picture of our deer stand here. This is not exactly what our deer stand looks like, but it's kind of close. I mean, I think ours is taller. It's like on telephone uh, poles, and it's awesome. And I never knew you went hunting like that. It's so weird. But anyway, we get up into our stand, and I'm excited because we got up in the stand, for one, all by ourselves, <laughs> and so with a gun. And so anyway, so we get up in our stand, and uh, I'm watching for deer because, you know, I've been known maybe a few times when I've gone to kind of take a little nap a few times during, during the little hunt. And so I haven't always seen the deer come out. So I was really excited. I was trying to stay awake, and, you know, we're mid morning and, and kind of dozing off every now and again, or, you know, like trying to stay awake, but really struggling. And I spotted the deer. And so I'm so excited. I'm like, son, deer, deer, deer. And so I'm like, get your gun up. And so anyway, a buck was chasing a doe. We haven't seen a buck all year or, or all season as, we, as we've been. And so I was really excited that we got to see that. And, and anyway, so here he comes out and he's running all over the field and he goes away. I'm like, dog, con, man. All right. But get your gun up, son. Just be ready. All right. And so anyway, we wait a little longer and I'm sitting there praying, God, bring him back, bring him back. You know, that's about all I can do is pray. You know, I don't know how to rattle or anything like that. So anyway, so he comes back in. I see the doe and I'm like, son, get your gun up. There he is. And I said, just wait for it. The buck will come. And then Hayden said, man, there's the deer. There's the buck right there. I'm like, okay, all right, well, let me grab my, my phone. And so I'm going over here to get my phone so I can video it. It's a boom. I'm like, okay, well, you shot it. And then all of a sudden, boom, got another shot going. I'm like, hey, awesome. Did you hit it? You know? And so we're watching the deer, watching him move a little bit and kablump, he falls over. And I'm like, man, score. Good job. And it's a line for you, deer. So he's, he's dead. He's down. And my son is so excited. And we go down, uh, from our stand and we're going down to find this deer and, and, you know, he's right there and we come, come over to it. And there he is. Beautiful eight point deer. I was so excited. I was like, yes, thank you, Jesus. I was like, score. Mom did it. We went hunting. And so anyway, so he's looking at his um, deer and we're taking pictures, you know, and having that moment. And then he's like, Mom, are we going to drag this deer out of the woods? And I'm like, absolutely. Yes, we're going to do it because I came out here to go hunt. We're going to do this. Yes, we are. So I was like, okay, yes, we're going to do it. You grab that side. I'll grab this side. And so off we went. We start dragging this deer. So we made it like 25 yards and then we're like, okay, okay hang tight just a minute. And so every muscle in my body, you know, I'm trying to, I'm feeling it now because you just don't do this very often. You don't drag deers out every day, you know? And so my son was like, Hey mom, we're making headway. And I'm like, absolutely. We're getting this deer out one way or the other. We're doing this. And so we get so far and then, you know, I'm like, I'm just going to take a break for a second. We're almost, we're almost to the hill where we can just kind of go down the hill. And so he's like playing around with the deer, looking at him. He gets on him, you know, and like, I don't know, was going to bull ride him or something. And he's playing with his horns and stuff. And then uh, all of a sudden he jumps off real quick, jumps back. And he's like, whoa, that was crazy. Did you see that, mom? And I'm like, no. And he's like, look at his eyes. Look at him. I thought that deer came back to life. It was a great time. We had a great hunt. But you know what? What happens? You know, like when you flatline, when that deer flatlined, does it come back to life? Ah, uh, I don't know. But the question we're going to look at today is, do you believe there is life after the flatline? John chapter 11, we're going to be in verse 1, and we're just going to kind of roll through this together. So if you're ready, we're starting here. It says this, now a man was sick, Lazarus, from Bethany. And the village of Mary and her sister Martha. And Mary was one who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair. And it was her brother Lazarus who was sick. So we're going to talk about Lazarus. And, it, and so the sister sent a message to the Lord and he said, The one you love is sick. 
And so when Jesus heard it, he said, the sickness will not end in death, but it is for the glory of God. So the son of God may be glorified through it. So Jesus loved Martha and she, he loved his sister and Lazarus. And so when he heard he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place that he was. Okay. I just have to pause there. Excuse me. Okay. He loved that. He loved Lazarus. And he loved the Mary and, and Martha, but he stayed two more days after he was requested. Hey, Lazarus is sick. You've got to come, but Jesus is going to stay two more days. Anybody in here a procrastinator? Yes, because that totally looks like what Jesus is doing. He's just putting it off. He's just like, two more days. It's going to be fine. Lazarus is going to be fine. I'm just going to wait. Yeah, that's exactly what Jesus was doing. So it was like, man, what are you doing? So if you think that it doesn't make sense, totally didn't make sense to uh, Martha or Mary either. But we'll pick it up in verse 7, and it says this. Finally, he said to his disciples, let's go back to Judea. And, you know, then right there, I just have to stop and pause again. Because, you know, it, Martha and Mary didn't understand what Jesus was doing. Two more days, you know, wow really? You're going to put me off? And then the disciples, the, he looks at the disciples and says, hey, we're going to go back to Judea. And, you know, you really had to be there. Of course, if you look on down the scriptures, it says, man, they had just escaped from Judea. They were about to be killed in Judea. But here Jesus is going to go back? Like his disciples are thinking, what in the world? Really? This is, this is what we're going to do? And I can't even imagine what it was like to be a disciple because, you know, some of the things they encountered just wasn't right. I know they probably didn't understand everything that Jesus was doing. You know, aren't we similar? Like, we don't always understand what he's doing. Like, what in the world? That is so weird. Why are you doing it that way? But I think, you know, it's funny when we think about the disciples, because I think if they could set us down and tell us some stories, we would really, really be amazed. And I think this is kind of what they would say. You know, uh, some, one, of the, one of the best stories I think they could tell you is about a time when they were at a Jewish wedding. You know, and they were at this wedding, and, you know, the, like the caterers, they miscalculated the drinks. Like they didn't take the right count for the drink orders or something, you know. And so they're out of drinks. And so, you know, the disciples will tell you, you know, Jesus stepped up to the plate. You know, obviously he was like kind of pushed by his mom to get up there and do something. But, you know, Jesus stepped up to the plate. And so he says, hey, guys, see these big jars over there, these big water cisterns over there? You need to go get one of those. Get six of them and bring them over here. And you can look at this picture right here. This is kind of what it looked like. I mean, they weren't any small jars. They were like 30 or 40 gallon jugs that you would need to go put the, put the water in. And so anyway, it was for pur purification rituals. Now, this is what it would more look like back in the day. But he said, go and fill it to the very top. And so the disciples were like, water? For real? You just want us to put water in it? I mean, like, this is a high-to-do party. I mean, this is a very, very expensive party, and we're going to, like, serve our guests water? For real? And Jesus was like, yes, and bring me a cup, and you guys dip some water out of it. Get a cup full of that water out of that jug, and I want you to take it to the head caterer. Back then, it was called the chief servant. But was like the head caterer and said, now take that to the head caterer. And so like his disciples probably would have been like, now, hey, Jesus, I've got some Propel in my pocket, kind of like some country time lemonade. Do you want me to squirt some of that in there on the way? Because like, seriously, you want me to just bring them water? Like that's going to work? Like surely they want some sweet tea or something, right? I mean, this is a high to do party. And Jesus was like, just go and take it to the caterer. So he did. And on the way, you know, he gets to the caterer and the caterer is going to take a drink and it turns into wine. And so right there, the disciples were like, whoa, what just happened? And, you know, that was not only the first occurrence that they seen. You know, when we look back, there's a list of them. And so um, right here, you could see, man, they went and they seen Jesus heal two different sick people. I mean, just flat healed them and feeding of the 5,000. Don't forget about that one because that's no, no small nugget, you know. And then we look at it and it says that Jesus walks on the water. Yeah, the disciples will tell you they, they don't forget that one because Peter almost drowned. You know, he fell in. Yeah, it was the, the walking on the water. 
And then don't forget the healing of the blind guy. You know, that had never been done before. Like never once had a blind guy been born blind and was able to see again. That never happened. And Jesus did all of these things, and his disciples walked with him the whole time. And they seen miracle after miracle after miracle. And so they would tell you these stories. But one thing they would tell you is, I will tell you this. If he did it then, he can do it again. And I'm just going to be honest with you. Something's about to happen. I don't really understand his ways, and I don't know what he's all about, but I'm telling you something's about to happen. Verse 11, it says this. So our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep. So Jesus is starting to tell this story to his friends. So Jesus knows what happened. You know, Lazarus is going to die, but he's telling his followers, he says, okay, so Lazarus has fallen asleep and they're going through, well, surely he'll get better. He's sleeping. He's going to get healed. He's going to be better. He's going to die. He's, Lazarus is dead. And so, you know, obviously I just, you know, the, the disciples are probably like, why did we wait two days? Like he's dead for sure. He's dead. Flatline. You know, when you are watching a monitor in a hospital and you, we all know that familiar sound where it says the beeps and the beeps, you know, and it's, it's, it's monitoring our heart, you know? And so when we hear those beeps, we begin to see that that monitor is, uh, calculating the, uh, the heart muscle and how it's contracting. And it just begins to beep every time it senses an electrical, uh, connection there. And so when it stops feeding back those electrical pulses, that means it's hitting a flat line. As a general rule, your body needs blood flow. Your brain needs blood flow. And any time that that stops happening, about three to four minutes in, cells start to die. Like your brain cells start to die about three or four minutes in. And then if it doesn't have the proper blood flow and that blood is not, the heart is not pumping the blood, about 10 minutes in, the brain cells start to die off and stop functioning and just start to go away. And so we know that he's only got about 10 minutes before there's major, major issues. So let's look at verse 17. We're going to get in this. It says, so when Jesus uh, arrived in Bethany, he was told that Lazarus had been in his grave for four days. Well, good job, Jesus, on the whole procrastination thing. He's been dead four days. Well, you know, that's really important because, you know, we learned that it only takes like 10 minutes for brain cells to start shutting down and dying off. But you know what? There was a bigger thing on that deal because, you know, back in those days, it took, they kind of believed that for three days in, your spirit kind of stuck around. So there was still hope for you. Like, as long as it was only within the three days, maybe that, you know, the gods would raise you back up. But on that fourth day, all right, flatline, you're gone. There's no hope for you. In verse 18, it says this. Now, Bethany was only a few miles down the road to Jerusalem, and many of the people had come to console Mary and Martha because, you know, there was grieving going on. There was, obviously, they had already buried Lazarus, and, you know, he was gone. They didn't expect him. It was over. Like, there's no life after flatline. And so Martha caught wind that Jesus was in town. And oh, girl, do you know? She probably was like an old black lady, big old black lady, because she came out and she went and found Jesus. And she said, Jesus, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. You know, sometimes we say, Lord, you could have prevented this. Lord, if you would have been there for me, I know that this didn't have to happen. You know, and then we don't always show our frustration with the Lord. But sometimes we look around. We start comparing other people's lives, don't we? Like, I I promise you this happens. Like, never with me, never with me. No, never with you either. But you know what? We do tend to look around at other people, and we're, like, looking at their life, and we're saying, well, you know, her husband goes to church. Why can't my husband go to church? All he does is sit and watch TV and eat Doritos. You know, like we don't do that, you know. But you know what? We don't always see the backside of those stories, you know. Like like the person that comes to church, you know, you may not understand that they have struggles just like you do. You know, we may not always see their struggles sticking out in our face. But, you know, like the girl that you want to be like, you know, she's so beautiful. You just want to be like her. You want to look like her. Well, you don't realize that she spends hours in the mirror You don't realize that she struggled with insecurity for years and that she just wants to be somebody else. Like she spends hours looking like she does and she's still not happy with herself. You know, there's another thing, you know, sometimes we look at people and we say, I want to have that much money. But, you know, sometimes we don't look at the other side and look at those people and say, they're still not happy. Like they make a lot of money, but they work all the time. Like they're workaholics. 
Like they don't, they don't see the other part of the struggle. We just want to see the good things. We just want the good things. All of the good. We don't want anybody's struggles, just the good things. You know, that's not the way that it happens, but that's so often. We want perfect now. We want perfect in this world. And perfect doesn't exist in this world. But all the time we're thinking, Lord, why are you making this happen to me? Lord, take this from me. Lord, don't let this happen to me. And all the time we're saying, Lord, make it perfect. And there is no such thing as perfect. Like there's not that on this earth. And what we don't realize is we're asking, we're, we're really asking, Jesus, I need you. In verse 22, it says, but even now, Martha says this to her, you know, hey, Jesus, you, you failed me. Like, I don't know why this has happened, but even now, and see, we begin to see the condition of Martha's heart right here. It says, but even now, I know that God will give you whatever you ask for. And see, even now, and, and it goes on to verse uh, 23, and it says this, Jesus told her, your brother will rise. And she's saying, yes, I know, Lord, he's going to rise when you come back again. That's going to happen. And he's saying, no, you don't understand. Your brother will rise again. He says, and he, he says something very powerful because I think sometimes we tune out Jesus when he talks to us, you know, because if it's not right now, if it's not going to happen right now, it's just not going to happen. But that's not, that's not always God's way. And he tells her something so profound. And he says this, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me, even after dying, will live. He's saying something so profound. It's not of this earth. It's not the perfect uh, uh, thing of this world because there is no such thing as perfect. And Jesus is saying, I am everything that you need. Everything that you're looking for and everything that you're wanting, you're wanting to package in this beautiful picture, but it's really in me. I am the resurrection and the life. If you believe in me, you will live. And he asked her, he said, do you believe this, Martha? Martha. And that's a personal decision. And then that's one that we're all faced with and we'll all have to come to conclusion with when Jesus comes to us and he says, hey, who do you believe that I am? Because the whole book of John is, that's the layout of it. That's his purpose is saying, look, look at who Jesus is. Look at all that he's done. Look at the miracles. Look at the things that he's done. Now judge for yourself. What are you looking for? Because Jesus did this. Well, what are you looking for in this? Well, Jesus did this. Look what he did. Now Jesus is coming to a very crucial point. He's asking us in ourselves, what do you believe? Do you believe there's life after flatlining? You know, I realize that some of us have come in here and we're flatlining. Like you don't know what you're looking for because you're not really sure about that. You're not really even sure what's going on. Maybe you don't know how to fix it. But that's the cool thing right here is Martha didn't know what to fix. She didn't know what was going to happen. She just came to Jesus and just told him how it was. Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. This wouldn't have happened. But then the Lord came to her and says, but what are you looking for, Martha? And she said, but even now, Lord, I know that you're who I need. He was finished meeting with Martha. And so Martha goes back and tells Mary, Mary, Jesus is here. And so Mary, broken in all of her sorrow, goes and runs to Jesus and says, Jesus broken down and just says, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. Broke it into pieces. But then she said, but even now. You know, it was such a beautiful thing as I began to read this text because, you know, in this passage, I just see God's heart for his people. Because Mary came the same way that Martha did, except I think Mary was just completely broken. And she came to his feet and just said, Lord, I'm so broken inside. But if you would just do what you can do, and only you can do, I know that something will happen. I know something's going to happen because I know who you are. You know what's funny is I see Martha making a declaration for God. Maybe she didn't really even know who God was. Maybe she hadn't accepted him. Maybe she really didn't have that relationship with him. But Mary, I feel like she did. And I feel like she was broken at his feet because you know what? Maybe you've come in this place and you're flatlining. You've walked with Jesus. You know who he is, but you're in a situation like you're just broken to pieces at his feet. You know, that's a very real place. And I just, I love this because when you look at the text, Jesus wept with her. He was so broken for Mary. He he fills us. He fills our pain. Never one thing, never one drop or ounce of our emotion does he not walk with us through that. 
And so I, I, I just looked at this and I thought, God, you love your people. You love us when we're far from you or when we're close. As we get back to the text real quick, and it says this, and so Jesus became angry in himself. Do you know he's angry about the things that happened to us, the injustices? And he said this. He said, remove the stone, Jesus said. And here comes Martha, and Martha says, you know what? Lord, his body's already decaying. There's no hope. There's no hope. And some of us have made ourselves believe that, that there's just no hope. Like, this is the way it's always going to be. I'm always going to struggle with pornography. This is the way it's always going to be. My husband left me. I'm just, I'm never going to recover from this. Like, this is the way it's always going to be. I don't know for sure if I can ever get out of this hole. Like, I don't know what I've done to myself, but my addiction is so massive. I can't escape from it. Look, I know how long it's been. I know how long you've struggled with this. I know how long you've been walking in this season. I know how long it's been since you wanted to encounter me. I know everything. I know it's been four days. Yeah, I know it seems impossible right now because, you know, it looks like all hope is gone. The flat line is is laid out. And that's not who Jesus was. And he was showing himself real. He said, you know what, Martha, I know how long it's been. I know you've been waiting. But Jesus said to her, didn't I tell you? Didn't I tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? Didn't I tell you that? Because some of us need to be reminded. And it says, so, the, so they removed the stone, and Jesus raised his eyes to the Father and thanked him that he heard him. And he said, I know you always hear me, Lord. This is not for my benefit, but for theirs. God, I pray to you right now, not because you can't hear me, but I'm praying out loud so everyone in this room can hear me. Lord, I want them to know that you sent me and that they can believe on me. And he said this, and he shouted with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out. And he was bound, and the Lord said, free him and let him go. So is there life after flatline? Depends on what you believe. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. And anyone who believes in me will have life. And you can make that declaration today by praying a simple prayer like this. Jesus, I believe that you are what I need. I confess I've done wrong things, and I'm lost. I came in here flatlining with no hope, but I know that you're my hope. Forgive me, Lord, and come into my heart and give me new life. Thank you, Jesus. If you're a believer and you're just going through a hard season... I want to encourage you and even challenge you with this. Each day, find a quiet place to spend with God. Turn on a worship song and just focus on the words. Then open up your Bible. Read a chapter. Start with John. Just write down anything that stands out. In that time with thanking the Lord, and then mention to Him all of your needs. I want to encourage you just to focus on getting to know the Lord better, even through your pain. In a couple of weeks, I want you to go back and just kind of look at what you've written down what you've journaled, and I want you to consider this question. How has journaling impacted your life? I know that it's changed mine. God truly is the life that we all need. He's the faithfulness that we all long for. And yes, there truly is life after flatline.